So what we've done so far is taken a module, a server, client server, and broken it up into generics and into specifics. In this section, you know, we will look at, give you some of the examples of the importance in doing so. So OTP behaviors will help you avoid accidental complexity. So things that are difficult because you've picked inadequate tools. You know, while some problems remain difficult in respect of the programming tools and middleware you use, accidental difficulties can be avoided. And you can avoid them by using tools that have already solved these difficulties, these problems, and just focus your energy on the problems which are truly hard. And this is one of the things OTP behaviors bring to the table. They hide some of the tricky parts of concurrent programming, handling them for you behind the scenes. So what is, well, what is the concurrency which happens? What is the concurrent interaction which happens between clients and the servers? Uh, clients will send a request to the server. If they expect a reply, the request is said to be synchronous. If they don't expect the reply, reply the request is said to be asynchronous. And as we mentioned, these requests are sent backwards and forwards through message passing. Now, message passing is often hidden in functional interfaces. And we do this for greater flexibility, uh, enhancing near debugging capabilities and information hiding. The information hiding allows us to change the protocol between the client and the server, so we are not restricted to um, request and reply, for example. Uh, we could replace the server with many servers or you know, remove it altogether and replace you know, the client API with just uh, functions. So you know, what, what it's doing is we're almost hiding the fact that we're dealing with concurrency. So let's go back to the accidental difficulties I was discussing earlier. You know, have a look at the following code. And we've, you know, we've tagged the messages. You know, request has the atom request, the reply has the atom reply. And by tagging all messages and maintaining a functional interface, you know, we use pattern matching to make, the, you know, to make the message passing safer. There is, however, a problem with this code. Uh, have a look at it and see if you can figure it out. You know, we've got the client, which is, which is sending a message to the server. So we've got a request, we've got a PID, and we've got a message. How do we actually know that the response the client receives comes from the server and not from any other process. You know, if we've got a race condition like this, this process might send a response of the former reply, reply back to the client. And the client is in a receive statement, it pattern matches and believe that this reply is actually the reply from its original request, which it isn't. This request here actually would have been then placed in the client's mailbox. So you know, this is one of the typical race conditions which you know, we, we see when we're dealing with, um, with concurrent programming. And you know, we address this issue with unique references. So, uh, the build, the BIF, BIF function, the built-in function make ref returns a unique reference used to tag a message and identify its reply. We bind that reference to a value. Uh, uh, we bind that reference you know, to the variable ref, and we send it off to the server. And the server tags its reply with that reference. So in our request function, when we actually enter and pattern match in our receive clause, the variable ref in there is already bound. And you know, that guarantees that the only, reply, only the replies to our request is pattern matched. Any other requests which follow a similar format will have a different reference and they will remain in, uh, they will remain in the mailbox and not be handled. So this, you know, this resolves one problem, but you know, have a look at this code. Once again, there's still, there are still problems with it. You know, what happens if once we've sent a request, What happens if once we've sent a request, the server terminates? It could terminate you know, before it receives our request. It could terminate uh, after having received the request whilst handling it, but before sending back a reply. Our client remains hanging. 
uh, and it doesn't move. Now, we could resolve this problem with timeouts, but we then have a problem. Uh, what happens if what happens if the server is just very busy and the message is sent after the timeout? So this is where monitors come into the picture. Uh, monitors are unidirectional links that allow us to detect failures or missing processes without the need to wait for a timeout. So in this example, you know, the built-in function airline monitor will create a unidirectional monitor between the client and the server. And so if the server doesn't exist or if it terminates um, whilst we're monitoring, we get a down message with this you know, unique reference. If the server works and we get, back a, uh, we get back a response, we go in, we demonitor uh, that server and return the reply as part of the request. So you know, it won't affect the server and it works. But once again, you know, there's an issue with this code. There are race conditions which can happen. And ha have a look at it and see if you can spot them. So what happens if, upon having sent the request to the server, the server responds with the reply. But before pattern matching and before receiving this reply, and calling the monitor, the server terminates. And the termination could be because of you know, another client sending a bad request, or it could be you know, terminated by one of its supervisors. We call the monitor, which you know, removes you know, the monitor, but the down message from the server is already in our mailbox. So you know, you know, whilst we've solved the problem, you know, we've created another one. Luckily, we can pass the flush option to the demonitor bif, which ensures that if, uh, if there are any down messages, they're removed from the mailbox. So, you know, these are just some of the borderline conditions which can occur when dealing with concurrency. There are actually many more which are taking care of you, you know, behind the scenes. And, you know, to sum up, you know, OTP behavior libraries will, you know, take care of many of these accidental difficulties which you would otherwise have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And more often than not, they're very borderline and edge case. So when you do come across them, you know, they'd be very, very hard to understand and, and realize. So you know, with this in mind, you know, let's look at the libraries, the OTP behavior libraries in more detail and see what they have to bring.